Well, hello, everybody. I, I have a book. I have notes. I am prepared to lead. Um, we are going to talk about immersive worlds today. Uh, we have four different takes on immersive worlds represented by the people in the room here, none of whom are shy about talking. Uh, I'm going to moderate. Uh, and I will dive in occasionally because, of course, I have strong opinions, most of which are my own. Um, so I'm just going to dive in and start. The worlds we're talking about are somewhat different than each other. Between uh, Galaxy's Edge, Pandora, the world of Avatar, Aulani, and Treasure Cove, all of which are worlds that immerse our guests in different kinds of ways and for slightly different reasons, uh, with slightly different techniques. So it should be interesting uh, for the four of us, once we begin talking, uh, to explore uh, how, this, how this all fits together. And I'm gonna start with a series of questions. And the first one, you know, we have a long tradition as a company of building stuff anyway. Why now worlds? Why worlds? Um, and I will turn first to Scott. This feels like a game show. I know. No, 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 but I'm gonna ask Do you. I buzz in? Do, do, do. Um, I don't know that this actually is a big change, um, saying that now we're building larger immersive worlds than we did before. I actually believe that that was, if you go back to Disneyland's original roots, I think it was at that time also this idea of inviting guests and audiences to step into worlds that they maybe had seen only on screens or read about in books, maybe in the early days of television. Um, but given the, the technology that was available, given the, you know, the kind of the resources that were available at the time, I'm not so certain that we're not doing with these worlds today exactly what Walt Disney would have wanted to do in the early 50s had that been an option for, 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 for him and, and the rest of the Imagineers that were working at that time. We just have better tools today, right? We have a lot more technology. We have a lot more ways in which we can engage an audience. And also, our audience's expectations have grown exponentially since the kinds of entertainment experiences, the kinds of immersive entertainment experiences that, they, that were available to them in the early 50s. An opinion. Jeanette, yes. you're kind of, this is an interesting thing, because Aulani immerses people in a world that's actually real. And I want to sort of turn that same question to you about what is the value of immersion when we're dealing with an actual real place that's right outside the door, which is Hawaii with Aulani. Okay, we should just step back. And I, I can kind of see you guys through the crowd, but how many people here have been to Aulani before? I'm seeing comments. Woohoo! Oh, okay, great. for those of you that have been there, you guys may have had preconceived expectations of what you thought Aulani would be like, knowing what you thought the Hawaiian culture was about. And it turns out that, you know, that preconceived notion of what Hawaii is and what the Hawaiian culture is is actually not right, right? So for us as Disney, and everybody expects us to do the best, be the best, um, give our guests the best possible experience, we could not stand up and say we're Disney and give them the wrong experience, the inaccurate experience. We we knew that if we wanted to help tell uh, the Hawaiian story, that we needed to do it right. And to create a world in which we were actually showing you what that looked like was really important to us. I always say that Disney was just the best possible blank canvas and the native Hawaiian culture was the paint, right? Because when you go to Hawaii, you'll get the beaches you expect, you'll get the balmy breezes, the great drinks, but we give you more. Right? We give you the real stories of the place. We actually, it doesn't exist anywhere, right? The thing about Aulani is, it is not a replica of a Hawaiian village. It's not meant to be um, something that you would see in a museum, right? It takes, it's a world that we built is informed by the past in this present moment looking to the future. And so when we want our guests to come through the door, we want them to know this is a world and it's about real things and real subject matter, but we're giving you more than you ever expected. Well, that thing about, this is another, so you mentioned that thing about the audience has preconceptions mm -hmm. about what they think Hawaii might be. And by immersing them in this other essence, you sort of move them towards a better perception of what it is. Now, now Luke, you have another challenge in right. that you have an audience with no preconceptions right. uh, uh, of the world you're presenting. Or, or just those that they you know, had from seeing the movies and some other exposure than what we're accustomed to. I think you know, the interesting challenge there was it was right in between because the, you know, the world of Pirates of the Caribbean is partially the real world. It's partially imagined. It's partially newly imagined. It has some characters that are from the real world and, and even like moments in history. So we wanted to kind of, you know, work off of all of these 
to create that immersion. And back to the question, you know, immersion, I think, to me, is all about extending the story. So, and, and once it becomes a world, once it becomes the, the size of a world, now you have agency, as you've taken to a whole different level in Star Wars. So in Treasure Cove, it was that introduction. So it's a lot of different things, right? So it's the invitation to step into the world, to celebrate the things that you've seen before, to extend your knowledge, to, to en embrace new experiences. That's, to me, what the immersive quality of a world does. So I'm going to stay on that for a second, because again, with Pandora, we had this, uh, it's sort of, again, sort of a thing where you have a, a story. Uh, it doesn't have the longevity of Star Wars. It's a more recent story. We, it's setting inside of a park that is already about a big idea about conservation. So again, we have a filter we have to apply a little bit like Aulani, a little bit like you, where we want to talk about Avatar, but we really only want to talk about the parts of it that harmonize with the place where we're putting it. Um, and to get you inside of this world for the purpose of making you think about the same things you think about all the time. So you're coloring, you're kind of coloring the world towards an effect. You're coloring, it's not, in each case, the world that is presented is presented for an underlying narrative purpose. And that kind of colors what you immerse people in and why you immerse them in this and not that. So. I want you to talk a little bit about the choice. Just what am I immersing people? What, what and why did I choose to put them in that? I think you can't ignore the context that people are already coming to these experiences with. It's always a negotiation between the author, the, the audience member, and the medium. Um, and so when you invite someone to come into a world, whether it's an imagined world or whether we're presenting a world like Hawaii, where we are trying to almost correct a misperception of that world, we have to understand the perceptions that most of the audience is coming with, right? Or the, 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 the base software, right? The archetypes, the, the tropes, the, 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 the preconceived notions. And we can't just ignore those. We have, to, we have to integrate those into the way we tell those stories because that's who our audience is and that's how they're coming. So we, 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 need to, we need to meet them as they're presenting themselves to these experiences so that we can take them from that place and then through, the, through a hopefully transformative experience, move them from where they start to where we want them to go. You know, we, we build these things, we build these experiences for a purpose, right? So that people can have an experience that hopefully is, you know, as, a, as an author of that experience, we're trying to move them towards a goal, um, whether it is to have a great time or whether it is to better understand a real culture and to kind of like sweep away those misperceptions or whether in the case of Galaxy's Edge, whether we just want to um, have people feel like they are empowered and enabled to become a hero in their own lives and in the lives of the people around them, we have to take them as they present themselves to us, right? right. We can't ignore that. Right. So all those, all those preconceived notions have to be built into the experiences we build. I, I, when we were doing Aulani, I mean, when we were doing um, Avatar, but also Aulani, we would talk a lot about the untutored eye. Like, what does a person not know you know, and, and, and what is it about what they see and experience in the moment that's gonna propel them into that world, that's gonna get them past the world they're in, into this created world, because you kind of have to strip your mind of what you know in order, in order to understand what people might not know in order to be able to get them in uh, to the world through design. And you have all these different reasons people might not know something, including you're presenting it in a completely different country and culture, yeah. or you're presenting a culture that's, that's less known. But what's an example, like a thing that you could imagine people would not know, oh. that you need to use the design yeah. to get them to understand about that world. Okay, so I just, we'll talk about, let's just, we are a storytelling company. Right, and story is not expressed just by words, as you know, right? You've gone all to our parks, I imagine you have. Our storytelling is embedded in everything we do, and I will tell you, we all, we think about this, right? Now, in the case of Aulani, I promise you, every decision was, was motivated by giving you visual cues to help tell a story, or for you to unravel a thread that led to something else that was more meaningful. So if you go to Aulani, you know, average days, weekish or so, Many people come back year after year after year, and we didn't expect you to get it the first time you walked through the door, right? In fact, we 
purposely held back. And some things are overt, but some things are actually very subtle, right? So anywhere you walk through that resort and you make a choice or you, you ask a question and say, what is that thing right there? Like I'm standing in front, st I've never noticed it. This looks really great the first time I see it. This is a beautiful thing. And then you maybe might ask a cast member, right? And say, what does that thing mean? And then they start with the story and that actually get you motivated to actually start digging deeper and deeper and deeper. In fact, one of the things I learned very early on about the Hawaiian culture is the more that I learned about the Hawaiian culture, the more I learned I knew nothing about the Hawaiian culture. I kind of think that's true for every single one of these worlds that we build. There are Imagineers, there are folks in the community, there's people who come together to create things that you will never know about, that we think about in the background. And as you start to learn more, you know more, and your, your level of engagement and um, the way that you connect with that story just it grows personally for you in a, in a, in a unique, unique way, so. S behaviorally, people in the space. I'm sort of, I'm sort of, you know, we create these spaces, but then there's all this sociological stuff about people in the space. It's a physical built thing, and now you have behavior in the space. How do you, let people know who they are and what is expected of them in the space. And I know you have a dozen answers. I'm going to start with Lou. Sure. I'll buzz uh, in if I need to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do we answer in the form of a question? No, no, no. You, okay, you, okay. You, you can, is this Jeopardy? You can, as a matter of fact, I would love to see an interpretive <laughs> dance because I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'll join you in an interpretive dance about large scale. Uh, a pas de deux. But only at the end. Um, I think, so the, the, in Treasure Cove, what we were trying to do was to take an audience which, you know, by the way, going into a brand new market, we do a lot of research, but we also have a lot of people advising us as to what people will and won't do and what they like and don't like and so forth. Um, and that's very, very challenging. So we actually went out in many, many places in China to look at how people enjoy themselves, to kind of have an idea for ourselves, not just to kind of understand what we were informed they would do. So for example, we were told that guests in China would not want to get wet, that they would not want to do anything you know, physically difficult, that they would have trouble immersing in, in stories and so forth. Right now we're ordering a second canoe that's going to go around that lagoon just because people love it so much. Okay. Uh, the water play area is always filled with people that are just, you know, spraying each other like crazy all the time. So there's a lot of things that turn out to not be true because they're kind of more universal. People love to have fun. So it, coming into Treasure Cove, we had to give them kind of a reason to want and to engage very quickly. The canoes are a great device for that because you come in and you get the story right away. But also we set it with all these vignettes along the way that kind of tell you, because they have their own story, what, you know, that the pirates have taken over this place. Now you can be comfortable, you can engage. And then the deeper you Wait, go. I'm stop. So that's a good one. How do I know the pirates have taken over the place? That's a set of visual cues, right? Exactly. So there's like signage, you know, not signage. They're all vignettes, props, things, you know, moments that have happened. You can see there's a, there's, there's a cage with a skeleton of poor pirate Pete who just wasn't enough of a pirate. And there's a sign that tells you <laughs> the rules that he broke by not being enough of a pirate. He actually, like, was nice to people or whatever. So what? It, it's just like, right. Um, so there's all kinds of things that are, we tried to make them all humorous because this this is also not obvious and it's not like the real pirates of the world. They're Disney's pirates of the Caribbean. Um, but then the deeper you go, the more overt you become with it. And when you get on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, you know, right off the bat, you're coming in and the, uh, you know, the Captain X, X uh, you know, alter ego in that one, you know, tells you you're going on a journey. But when you enter the caves, it's Jack whispering to you, treasure. That's what it's all about, mate. That's what you're dreaming about, treasure. And he's drawing you right in because that's the universal thing. Everybody wants treasure. From that point on, nothing matters. I'm drawn in. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, see that. <laughs> Tell me more about the treasure. <laughs> you have to get on the ride. Oh. <laughs> so, so Scott, you're doing this, you know, you have the similar thing. There's a, it's Star Wars. Yeah. There are different sides. Yeah. There are multiple factions. Yeah. And what would you say is my, the queuing system that helps me to understand as I walk in, oh, I get it. It's like this, it's like yeah. this, it's like that. Um, well, you know, the very first question we asked ourselves as a project team was, who are we? 
right? I mean, we, we, we knew we wanted to set out to build a place that invited us to be more participants than spectators. And so if we're, if we're going to become the pr protagonist of this story, then we need to understand who we are. So the very first set of questions we ask ourselves, well, who, well, who are we? Who could we be? Um, and then how do we kind of make that true for our guests when they walk in? What is those cues that allow us to kind of like very subconsciously um, have our guests understand their potential role in this? Um, so when you come into Galaxy's Edge, the locals will greet you with hello traveler, right? Or bright suns traveler, right? You, your role when you walk in is as a visitor to, visitor to this exotic marketplace on the edge of the galaxy. And then the whole um, village and the planet itself is laid out physically as a built environment in such a way that you can never see the whole place at one time. It, in, it is a place that is intended to, as a physical environment, symbolize your role as a curious traveler. So it is a place that is intended to invite exploration, intended to invite discovery, intended to present you know, uh, moments of surprise and unexpected, uh, unexpected details so that you can kind of feel like you're having your own little Star Wars story as you make your way through it. And I think you know, we build those, when we build these environments, it's true with all of these places we're talking about, we build that kind of cinematic approach to that storytelling into, you know, we don't have the luxury of editing and, and cinematography. We have to build in um, the tools that an editor uses to determine pacing and visual reveals and the tools that a, a, um, a cinematographer uses to kind of like a, a wide establishing shot or a tight close up. We have to build those things in physically so that as you go through these spaces, we kind of create that cinematic narrative through the built environment, which is actually, a lot of fun yeah, it is. <laughs> to figure well, that and stuff I, out. I want to add to that because this is a shout out to you guys because you know the reality is the audience is making it possible for us to create these worlds. This is this because pe people, you guys are voracious to dive in and learn more. We don't have to be nearly as linear and didactic as we used to be. We can make these giant worlds that then you guys go to explore and you're finding, you're finding the things that we've been, you know, as we designed for, you know, you know, so many years that we're hoping you'll find, well, you guys find them. It's awesome. You know, and the stories actually come to life because, you know, you're looking. With Animal Kingdom, we always basically are assuming you are you. It is today, but you are not home. So even, even Pandora, it sort of informs you right when you walk in. It's like so similarly presented to a national park or to a, a reserve with the signage that, that, that the assumption would be, we, we, we generally don't ask people to make a very big transit from what they are in the moment. Like not to exactly make believe that there's somebody else, but to make believe that there's somewhere else. And then to reveal in that case, oh, I get it. This is something like a national park or something like a nature reserve, but it's not on earth. You know, how many cues and how quickly can I read these to where I get it's safe to be here. I'm not expected to do something I'm not prepared to do. There will be opportunities here to engage mm -hmm. and to learn like that. In the case of Aulani, you know, people take this journey to come to Hawaii. And I think the lobby really is the thing that resets, like, who are you and what is this? Well, you know, people go to Aulani and they know they're going to a resort. They're not going to a theme park to walk around and do rides, right? So we have a lot to combat. But when you walk up, yeah, you see it from distance and you're driving up and you see these 15-story towers. It is a hotel right? But to your point, I mean, it's even before you get into the lobby, you drive right up and the thing that greets you isn't typical coconut palm trees that you would expect in Hawaii, right? It, it's a lo'i, which is actually a taro field that's very native and grows um, poi, right? Or taro that becomes poi. And then you walk into the lobby and yes, it's a lobby. It, it functions in all the ways that we expect a lobby should function. But all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, they're trying to talk to me. They're telling me things through the things that we've designed. Why is the water over there look this way with this rocky stuff here? And why does this look different? And why does that, what's in the floor? I mean, everything there is, yes, of course, we created all the programming that you need to be able to have a luxurious, awesome stay in Hawaii, but we're giving you more than you expected. And it is not what you thought Hawaii was. By the way, the, the, the Fab Five is there. 
They're on vacation though, right? right? They're not hosting, they're not at home. So, um, you know, Mickey and Minnie are at the luau with you, learning how to hula, right? But they're not, it's not their home, right? It's not anyone's home except the Hawaiians. And by the way, the thing is, you know, we, we talk, I always say, you know, we, we built the bones, right? But the, the heart, the soul there is the cast. And so many locals and Hawaiians are actually the ones that engage with our guests and continue out that storytelling that we just created the setting for, right? So I want to ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So one of the things that we've been talking about is this idea about how we're engaging our audiences, you, you, all of you, and kind of making this shift. If there is one shift maybe that we're making you know, from the 50s to now, it is I think we're trying to open up more room for our audience, for you all to become a part of this story. Do you guys like that idea? I mean, do you, do you <laughs> like that idea? Okay. Because it is hard. <laughs> well, and it, if it you didn't like the hard. idea, we should do something else. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess I kind of feel like, you know, in, in, in the world today, our assumption, I think, and I want to speak for everybody here, but I think our assumption is that there, that we see so much of a hunger for our, uh, to kind of co-create these experiences with these audiences. You know, a place like Disneyland is so much, you know, um, it is as much your park as it is anybody's, right? The fans, the fans have kind of, uh, and it, true, the same is true for Star Wars, right? It is very much um, a, a set of stories and characters that the, you know the fans have kept alive for so for so many years. Um, that it is making room for those fans in these stories. We just kind of assume that people kind of want to come and play with us a little bit more. But um, you know, hopefully you guys like that idea. Um, so if you don't. <laughs> Clap now. <laughs> Always clapping. Okay. Well, well th that. there's another thing in this because because the I mean I think <coughs> Galaxy's Edge is a good example. The world is so enveloping, so convincing, so thorough, um, and the choices you can make are so varied. Uh, and I want us each to think about this a little bit. Is this sort of um somewhere out there is a line between the theatrical presentation of a world that seems to be real and a real world. And the, the act of theater, you know, like good old Aristotle and Mimesis and this, this weird awareness, the, the awareness that it's not real is the thing that allows me to play as opposed to actually be afraid, actually be threatened, actually have steps. And where is that line and has the line moved that kind of question, I think, is an interesting one uh, to, to poke at because as it gets more realistic and as the effects get more realistic and as the people get more engaged, that line is definitely moving from the days of um, spectators. So, yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, it's changed notably, I think, for, in a lot of different ways, but I'll even use one example. Um, the, um, Pirates stunt show in Treasure Cove is very unique. And, and one of the things about it, we were wondering, right, because the, just kind of reeling back just in terms of, you know, your, your values and what's unique. So Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, the world is, it's real and it's magic at the same time. And it's scary, but it's funny at the same time. Now, we couldn't put all these things everywhere in the world at all times. The main ride is more scary and real but the stunt show had to go much more the other way, which was, you know, uh, uh, scary and magic, excuse me. And the other one was much more real and funny. So we pushed really hard. But what we found is, you know, as we were creating the show, we thought, oh, well, we'll open it and we'll find out what happens. In a very short time, guests were telling each other what, at what moment of the show to shout out, you know, calls and everything. So people would actually practice before coming to the show. To like say when when the when they said you know when you see the English boo so like everybody's ready you know, so like, so it was like boo and every the whole house even though it's the first time they're in the theater so I love the idea that people are so engaged prior that they'll do their homework to come and be prepared I think that you know thank God that's fantastic that line is clearly moved to the point where I'm ready to step in and have a great time and I'm going to do what it takes to actually just be you know engaged as soon as I can but I think that the idea of of moving that line is you know, we're moving that line in terms of level of immersion. I don't know if we're moving that line. Jeanette may feel differently about Aulani, but I feel like we're, you know, we're definitely increasing the level of immersion. I don't know that we're increasing the level of, re of reality, 
but we are increasing the level of believability, right? Believability in the story we're presenting. But when you go to a place like, you know, um, Treasure Cove or Galaxy's Edge, you're probably not really worried about being kidnapped and, you know, you know do I have to get a job here? Do I have to pay insurance? <laughs> you know, you're probably not, we, we don't want you to be worried about that. We want you to be immersed to the level that you can be so you're not having to use your mental power to kind of like forgive as much um, of the things that might break you out of that story. And we're trying to immerse you into that, a believable story so that there's enough things there that, you, that give you permission to play along so that you can take your mental focus and you can take your imagination and just focus it onto being a part of that story and playing with those characters and hanging out with the, you know, you, you tend to come to these experiences with your family and friends and people you want to hang out with. And we'd much rather you have your, your focus and attention being on playing together and having fun together than on having to kind of like do the math of figuring out, no, wait, where am I? And what am I supposed to be? And is this, where's the line of, of believability and, and reality? So I think as we increase that, as we move that line towards more believability versus reality, and, and more into immersion versus, you know, just kind of like, it's, it's almost like we're trying to, where, where we came from a tradition of giving you tools to pretend you're in a story, we're trying to move maybe into more into reasons to believe you're in a story. Mm. Um, and we're still kind of on that journey, of course, right? But um, I think, you know. So Aulani is different and, and by design. And I think it's because we knew that people had, I mean, first of all, it's, it's a 15 story hotel, right? You look around, we're not telling you that this is a real village. But we did actually purposely design places at Aulani that we wanted people to believe were real. And I think we did this on purpose. So there's a few places. If you walk through the Waikolohe Valley, and for those of you that have been there, you know, but it's the great, really pretty area that's got the, the rocks and the water and the, all that. But there's places there that we wanted you to think could have possibly been mm -hmm. 100 or 200 years old. It could there's, be from my old front yard in Hawaii. It's exactly, you wanted it to be like Makiki. We yeah. did specifically do it this way. Um, Ama Ama, there's an off the hook, um, you know, Hale structure. And we wanted you to believe it had the marks of people's names in it. We wanted people to believe, spoiler alert, that this was actually could potentially have been there because part of the people breaking their misconceptions of what the Hawaiian culture was, was maybe if they believed that this was, and it is, it's based on real facts, right? It's based on real stuff. But if they actually believed that this could be real, I think it would break through these misconceptions of what the culture was. So in the case of Alani, we did, we created immersive worlds where we wanted people to engage and connect. We added this level of detail, but I'll tell you the number of people who come up to me and said, hey, was that there? Like this is my favorite detail that yeah. Joe put in was this like concrete. So if you ever go to Ama Ama, which is the signature restaurant on the, on the ocean there, there's like this beat up, nasty, gnarly, like, um, tank, like cement, like fish cleaning yeah, sink, that. right? It looks like it's been there forever. And even the cleaning crew to this day will still try to like take the rust off of the, you know, little knob. And I'm like, guys, stop doing that. That's actually meant to look rusty and cruddy. And they're like, this, it is not been there. It's been there only for eight years, spoiler alert, since right. we've opened it. But people actually think it's been there well before we even came on property. Left. So back to the invitation part of this, before we move on to some other things. the the solicitation to be involved. I happen to be one of these people. There's like a cliche wherever I go. I am the guy that gets invited to stand up and dance with the hula girl or whatever country, whatever equivalent in any country of being invited at the thing to stand up and dance with the thing. That's me. <laughs> yeah, it's your earring. And I'm always like, like can't I please look at somebody else? I yeah. don't want to be the stand up and dance person. So I'm not actually, I'm kind of not that guy. Like not the, I, so I'm curious about the whole invitation process, how you engage, how you would bring people in, what level you would bring them in. How do you get people to get into it? Well, I think you used the right word, which is invitation, right? It, it, for all of these experiences, there has to be, it's an invitation to, to engage, not an obligation, right? It is. Um, because we, what, one of the things we know from, from our, our years of, of test, testing new ways to engage an audience and new ways to interact with an audience, um, one of the things that, that, we've, that we learned um, and keeps being reinforced for us is that you know, not everybody wants to engage at the same level. And, and any individual might not want to engage at the same level over the course of a day or even an hour. So we need to be able to give people uh, the freedom uh, where they can decide to engage. And, 
maybe talk with a character or in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, maybe with the Dis Play Disney Parks app, maybe take on a mission for the resistance. But then if you just want to go hang out at the local cantina and just get a, you know, a, a drink and watch, you know, watch the space world go by, that's got to be totally fine as well. Um, and so crafting the experiences so that you can come and engage with them when you want to, at what level you want to, um, and with whom you want to is really, really important, I think, so that everything feels like it is an invitation and you never feel like it, you know, you've got an obligation. So, oh, I got a, Chewbacca needs me to go deliver this part. I'll, you know, Grandma, I'll catch up with you later. <laughs> the the Wookiee needs me. You know, it can never be that kind of a situation. Yeah. Although you should help the Wookiee. Always help the Wookiee. Just, just, just don't say no to the Wookiee. Never say no to the Wookiee. Let the Wookiee win. I always say, let the Wookiee win. Uh, I, I have an example. It's kind of also you know, what we pay attention to that, that is sometimes the seed of an idea. Um, for, for me, when we were looking at, to create both Treasure Cove and Adventure Isle, and Adventure Isle does this mountain, tremendous, fantastic, you know, enormous waterfall, and it has this um, challenge trail, which is wonderful. Um, but in creating the place, um, the thing that made, that convinced me we had to make this experience um, was going around to you know, various other places, and I, I went on several um, of those challenge trails, which were not themed at all. But the dynamic I saw there that just totally like, took my heart and like, said, oh, this is important, was a challenge trail involves, many of you probably have done it, you, know, you walk on, on ropes and things, you're tied up with a, you know, a safety line and so forth, and you'd think it would be, you know, the little kid is going through and then there's the parent going, oh, you can do it, you can do it, you know, Susie, you can do it, Bobby. The dynamic I saw was oftentimes the kid would zip forward, <laughs> be on the other side of the dangerous obstacle and the parent be like, ooh, I don't know if I should do that. And so then it would be the kid actually empowering, yeah, that's you know, their great. parent, their father, their mother, and that, I mean, that flips everything. From that moment, anything's possible in that kid's life and in a parent's life, too. They've just seen something in their kid they never saw before, and the kid just realized, wow, I, I have power, too. This is great. So that, that was one of the seeds behind this whole thing, you know, all this giant amount of rock work. And <laughs> I mean, with, with Avatar, it's kind of a seduction. I mean, there isn't a huge amount of interaction in the mode that you have with... Um, uh, Galaxy's Edge, right? But there is this tremendous hypnotic level of mixing of real, unreal, real, unreal, mm -hmm. deeper and deeper, real, unreal. Is that plant real? That one might be real, you know, and you sort of get enveloped. We're really shooting for not so much uh, cognitive, who am I in the world, as an emotional, it's an emotional immersion, really. The goal of the land is primarily emotional immersion in this weird hypnotic feeling uh, of the world. Because there's not that much, it's, it's we, we don't have giant Navi walking around. You have to be inside of an attraction to engage the Navi. Yeah. But what you're engaging with really is environment itself. It's animal kingdom, you know, kind of what we want to get to. But we sort of do it through this, switcheroo-y kind of, that plant's real, but that one's not. Oh, that one. Oh, Don't tell me they're not real. Is, you know. Don't tell me they're not real. Oh, yeah. I want to believe they're all real. You are, you are strident about that thing. I had a tour with Scott of Galaxy's Edge in which he would just refuse <laughs> to talk like a designer. I'm, I will talk like a designer. <laughs> we did that job. Um, <laughs> So you live in whatever reality you want to live in. I'm going to live in, I'm going to live in my reality. You're still we, in like it. The, yeah. we like reality. I like reality. Again, to the point about not providing, uh, providing the choice, a lot of times we're happy to watch somebody do it, you know, or watch your child do it or watch, you know, a friend do it. Um, and that's enough. That, that's enough of a vehicle for someone. So I'll watch you do it next time. Um, <laughs> so that I don't have to, but also so I can benefit and just join in. I mean, it's, it, I think providing that level, right? So you don't want to like draw every single person into everything, you know? I think that's actually really important for, for, for the way that we as designers do think about these places is, and I kind of mentioned this before, is that, you know, unlike a movie or a book or, um, you know, a, a piece of media you're watching on a, on a, on a device or a game, 
which tend to be solitary experiences. I mean, even if you're going to a movie with your friends, you're sitting and you're, you're having a parallel experience. You're sitting next to each other, but you're not, you know, you're focused at the screen. You're not focused on each other. When we build these places, and all of the places we're talking about are examples of this, they're intended to be a place to share with your family and to share with your friends. And so, I mean, I know that we all build into these experiences moments where we encourage you to turn towards each other, right? For reflection, for engagement, to have fun with the people you love and care about and came to have a good time with. So we, ha we always have to think about these experiences um, as, as designers, as building in those moments where you're going to either make choices as a group or where, where we want you as a group to have a moment to turn towards each other instead of turning towards the, the more theatrical presentation that we've built for you. Pretty much we, what we try to do, we just try to facilitate memory making, right? I mean, quite simply, and we try to do it for every age, whether you're three or you're 93, right? And it's a pretty, it's a pretty daunting challenge. Like I think about, you know, everyone's got a conception of what a Hawaiian vacation looks like, right? We know what that looks like. But one of the things I still get to this day is, how many menahune are at Aulani? Like how many did you guys hide? I'm like, we didn't hide any out menahune. What are you talking about? Those are real menahune. So if you guys have been to Aulani, right? Like these menahune are hidden everywhere. And we did that for the kids, but it turns out that it's like the grandparents, the parents, everyone wants to know, right? So, you know, all we're there is to facilitate people making memories together, whether, you know, like, and it isn't just about you sometimes, it's about who you're with, Well, right? best example, I mean, just on a personal level, I, I, I've been through the, uh, the lightsaber experience twice. Yeah. N neither time did I actually get one for myself. Once was for my, my son, Same and another here. time was for a friend. I had just as good a time as as they did and I, I loved it. I mean it was actually kind of a different experience. I can look forward to doing it myself later. Yeah, it's more fun to see <laughs> but, my kids but do it. It's wonderful yeah. doing it. Absolutely. Especially with your child. You know? Yeah. We're keeping us on track. Go ahead. Right. Well there is <laughs> each of these, yeah again, they have a, a an ultimate purpose in, in in either enveloping you in a fantasy story, sort of enveloping you in a real world enveloping you in a new world you might not be as familiar with, enveloping you in an idea. And that, um, I'm just gonna talk for a second about this, the physicalness of the envelope. So you're putting people in a envelope, right? Of, of imaginary reality. Mm -hmm. And there are limits to it with Avatar Mm -hmm. One of the things we did that we hadn't really done quite like before is there's so much over your head. We're kind of handling the sky uh, inside this world. Um, with um, Galaxy's Edge, I notice, you know, you have these like, there's a sound environment of like jet traffic overhead. But this notion of how far the envelope where does the envelope extend to? Where does it stop? How do I know when I'm out? How do I know when I've left? That kind of, where, where's the terminus? You know, simple things, you know, are some very fundamental choices in Shanghai. Uh, one of them was that the first language and the only language for all the shows is Mandarin. So that no one is wondering what's being said or where things are or what things are. So that's the primary language. Now, there's thematic language that's in English to support it, because many people, of course, read and, and speak English. But, but we had to dis make that decision early on to say, OK, you know, that's accessibility. That's to make it good for everyone that comes there, because that's a 97% um, you know, mainland Chinese uh, audience. That's a choice we have to make. That was a lot harder for us, but that was one of those barriers we wanted to make sure we removed so that everything else was clear, yep. you know. I mean, you asked the question about how do we define the terminus, right? Or how, if we're doing our job well, um, we're constantly kind of redirecting you back towards the, you know, the center of that experience. I mean, even, even the things like we're doing in the sky, and I think, you know, I think Avatar um, Pandora does a fantastic job of, you know, not of kind of limiting your view shed, right? It, it gives you, right. you kind of are so am, am, amazed at what you're seeing, I think you just kind of give up and you're just kind of like, okay, it's real, I get it, it's real. And then you can kind of focus down here um, because we are, you know, we're kind of doing these things to kind of refocus you where we want you to be focused. You know, I think at Alani, it's interesting. I think about what I hope, I mean, it is a hotel, I keep saying that, but it's more, right? You go and it's more. And, I'm hoping, because we did take a lot of time to be thoughtful about every decision we made, that when we talk about what's this barrier, right? The, the Hawaiian culture, 
embeds every part of every decision we made there. So even when you stay in one of our hotel rooms, I hope our guests are saying, wow, they really thought about that. What's the shape of that light fixture? What, does that look like a, like a sail? Did I see that at the luau when they were doing the thing? Like, then that you went, wow, they really, like what's this thing printed on the bedspread? Is that like something that looks like the cast member costumes? Like we really did try to, you know, even though you could have designed a hotel room very simply, we, we did really try to say, how can we give you guys the opportunity to ask questions about what else it could lead you down to. So it would, it would, enri it would enrich your story, it would enri enrich your ability to connect and learn more. And by the way, if you didn't want to ask any questions and you really just want to look at the ocean and have a drink, you could do that too. But it was there for you. And we were very thoughtful about that in any cho every single choice we made, right? So I'm going to switch to another thing about just the sheer physical challenge of this. You're making a place that is, has to be built, right? And yet it represents in some cases, in the case of uh, um, Star Wars, for example, a world that people are super familiar with. In the case of Aulani, a world with cultural rules about what can and can't be depicted and how. Um, so just onto the physical challenge, the process challenges of getting this thing done. This is probably more anecdotal than anything else <laughs> about just the difficulty of making a world. So. Oh, Al Aulani was so, so challenging. That's why, well, that's when, it becomes, that's when it becomes a job, right? I mean, it, it is hard to do, right? And, it, and you know, if we are sitting here talking about this work, we're really representing the work of hundreds, if not thousands of designers that have put their blood, sweat, and tears into these places, doing everything from those textile designs to the lighting design to what the lighting fixtures themselves are. Um, you know, Imagineering really is a place where we can tap into just, the, just this amazing um, set of expertise across all these different disciplines that, that make it real. Um, but it is, it is, uh, it is those details that you know we, that we've all been talking about. I think that make it real for for Galaxy's Edge. You know, Star Wars has kind of a funny. I don't know that everybody does know the Star Wars design language, right? Because not not everybody across the globe has you know the same level of familiarity. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that makes Star Wars, I think, distinct from a place like Avatar, and even I think distinct from a place like a a more fantasy version of, of Treasure Cove. Um, and definitely different from Alani because it's not trying to represent a reality, is that Star Wars from the very beginnings, from the, from the very first films of the 1970s, had a very, very strong DNA of reality in it. You know, and I think that was largely driven by the production uh, constraints at the time. You know, they couldn't build, there wasn't a, a, you know, there wasn't a computer graphics uh, um, facility there, you know, at that time in the early 70s or mid, late, mid to late 70s, I guess. Um, so you had to go to location. So you had to go to the Redwood Forest. You had to go to the deserts of Jordan. You had to go to these places to shoot and then bring a little bit of Star Wars to kind of make it feel different. So the DNA of Star Wars design still has to this day a very healthy sense of it's a real place that has a real history and a real patina and, a, and the real wear and tear that has had a layer of Star Wars added to it. Um, and so that in some ways is a real challenge to build a place like Galaxy's Edge because we not only have to add that layer of Star Wars to it, but we actually have to do a credible job of building the base layer with a base level of kind of like believable wear and tear and believable um, history behind it um, to make it feel like it is consistent with the Star Wars design language that we see on screens and everywhere else. I think we, we had more flexibility with, uh, with Treasure Cove, which I appreciate uh, because there was the whole historical reference, right? So the whole fortress has a history that goes from the first person that came to the island that uh, started planting sugar cane, then um, started developing his own mansion and then developed that into a small fortress that was taken over by the English. And the English added more to the fortress and all this stuff is, is built into the design. But because we're not referencing a real place deliberately, it's, it's a unique island in the Caribbean, completely imagined. We had the flexibility to also cheer it up a little bit because if, you know, all research uh, showed us that fortresses tend to be gray and foreboding and stuff like that, <laughs> which is not kind of so cool, especially in the skies that uh, Shanghai can have, which can be gray and foreboding sometimes. So we needed to cheer everything up and, and, and bring color. So we, were, we had the license to do that, but that was very deliberate. Deliberate. Now, in executing that, this is the history, the, the story that's a little bit more anecdotal. You know, we were in China 
coming in with you know a team of Rockwork uh, experts, such as worked on uh, Avatar later on and many projects before. But where do you find the folks who are going to do that? Well, it turned out that we found this incredible tiny company that brought in workers from these two villages in rural China that were expert sculptors. And in this factory, someplace, you know, 50 miles out of Shanghai, they built most of what you see when you go there. Yeah. They sculpted it, they molded it. It was unbelievable. They absorbed this language from completely different culture, from the reference in pictures and in color boards and everything that we provided under the guidance of our experts and invented this, you know, developed this in such a beautiful way. I mean, that's, that's very much like the, the secret sauce behind it, right? right? And that's where it's fun, actually. That part of the work is really fun. So just really two seconds on Alani since I only I know we have five minutes left. Joe's giving me a look. Um, is, that, is that right? We have five minutes left? So. We, we don't, don't have a clock up here, so we're just guessing. Got five. Mm. But just Alani was not hard to, from a construction perspective, it, this is stuff we know how to construct. Why it was hard is that it would not exist today in its form if, it, if we did not have the relationships with the community, mm. if there weren't the thousands of Native Hawaiians who lent their voice, their knowledge, to help us build it. Because I'll tell you when Joe and I first started on that project, there was a skepticism within the community that they thought that we would n misrepresent the culture. And there's a huge responsibility uh, on Disney, on us, to, to, made sure that, to have made sure that that didn't happen. And so I will tell you, the, the hard part, first and foremost, was reprogramming everybody to say what's right and appropriate is the most important thing before it being magical, wonderful, and beautiful, right? And last thing, like I'll tell you, this is one little tidbit. We had no idea we were doing this, but um, so a Native Hawaiian had to tell us this. But because we thought all the art at Aulani should have been done by Native Hawaiian artists, because if it's about Hawaii, it should be done by them, at the end of the project, one of the Hawaiian advisor said to us, do you realize you have the largest collection of contemporary native Hawaiian art in the world? We're like, no, we didn't set out to do that. We just wanted to do the right thing, right? Like, so it, it's, there's thousands of Imagineers really, but it, it was the community that really allowed us to do what Alani is today. Right. There are these things that happen. Like when we started with Avatar, it's a CGI movie. You would expect that there would be CGI assets and we'd be able to use them and it looks photorealistic. We found when we went to work that when, you, when you're watching the film, all the mountains, all the trees, all the bushes, they're all behind somebody's head and they're talking, you know, they have a thing, it's a problem, bad guys are coming, and you're paying attention to these big faces the whole time. So when we actually went to look at the detail, we realized there wasn't enough detail. We're gonna have to go find a huge amount more detail uh, to make the world seem real, which ended up being one of the fundamental, like technical challenges was taking it beyond a CGI background. So. Last question really is, you put all this effort into making these worlds, worlds that are supposed to sweep people away, et cetera. What is the signifier of success? What is the moment of success? Uh, and I'll start with- I think with... the image is up there, so we gotta make sure it's Aulani first, right? All right, you, you go. So I hinted a little bit about the, the challenges that came with building Aulani, right? And we really wanted, and we did it for our guests for sure, but we also wanted to do, do right by the community and the Hawaiian culture. So we were very obsessive about making sure that we were doing things right and appropriately. We had this place at Aulani that's the spiritual center. It's called the Pico. Um, you'll see the Pohaku or the rock, this, this rock that there's a lot of work us trying to find and it had to be done by the Kapuna who, it's the whole thing. <laughs> and so it was the day before we were, we were previewing it to all of the construction workers workers and their family. And these construction workers, many of who are Hawaiian, all live on island, big thing. They bring all of their families out. We've done all of this work. We're hoping, oh my gosh, I hope like they're not like leaving and walking out the door because they're not proud of it at the end of the day. But as we're sitting there, there's a man that walks up with a ho'okupu, which is what you see there on the screen. It's a traditional Hawaiian offering. Right, and he basically came up and was offering this to us to say, this place is about Hawaii, this is a real thing. And, and he handed us to like, okay, we're, I, this goes somewhere. And we're like, we know exactly where it goes. That's and right. it goes right in the spiritual center. And we had our native Hawaiian culture advisor, they did the whole thing, all the protocol with it. And we're like, wow, Joe and I looked at each other, this is real. Somehow, all of this work that we put into it, uh -huh. it became real and it didn't become real just to our guests, right? More than that, it became real to the native Hawaiian culture. So a win there is, we did more for everyone, right? And that's success by my part. And, and as much as any of you guys go to Aulani, I hope you guys ask all those questions and engage in meaningful ways. So, honor. I think awesome. Luke is up next. <laughs> 
And I think we have a picture from, uh, from the Stun Show, right? Yeah. So this is a story I, I talked about earlier. I mean, this is amazing to think that many of these folks who didn't grow up with the pirate stories that, you know, we would have been very familiar with, who, uh, you know, at the time of those stories, their country was in a very different state. And they're coming to celebrate, to enjoy this moment and really do it together. And after this, you know, you'd see kids walking outside that, you know, brandishing the little, you know, swords kind of running around. And that just cheered me to my core because they completely absorbed the story with, you know, none of the, you know, whatever negative, you know, background there might have been and just enjoyed, you know, and, and cheered these characters on stage. Uh, to me, that that's wonderful. And you see all ages, you know, uh, that's one of the things that's great about the, you know, meeting this audience in China is that everyone in the family engages just equally. I mean, you see grandmas do exactly that. So it's really funny. Um, so that's, that's, I really love that. I don't understand any Mandarin. I did the same thing during the show. I was like, <laughs> just so you know, I was like, I don't understand what's going on, but this is exciting. <laughs> so with, with Avatar, we have this moment in the third act of the ride. I mentioned that Avatar is primarily about creating this hypnotic immersion in a mood, like a mood. And there's this moment and it's pretty much consistent. If it's gonna happen, it happens in the third act of the ride after you've come out of the cave where there is a very potent, peculiar emotion that's very hard to put your name on, but it affects a lot of people and it affected us as well. And we discovered this, it, it was a discovery. While we were developing the ride, we all started to have this emotion as we come out of the third act. And so then we started to try to cultivate it, but it is kind of the, the crosshairs of this land uh, that can sweep you up sweep you up emotionally because it's not like it they're not it's not an essay it's just this sort of poem uh, and this moment in the third act with this weird emotion that makes you feel kind of upbeat on the one hand but kind of weepy on the other hand very hard to define emotion but it's kind of the spiritual epicenter of pandora is this moment on this ride that sounds great so for, for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me last night. Thanks. I was actually over at Galaxy's Edge here. Has anybody been to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge? OK. So some of you may know this area. I was over in the Resistance Camp area, um, which will, in uh, at the, at the a very early part of next year, be recruiting new members of the Resistance. So hopefully you'll rise to that challenge. Um, but for now, I was, uh, I was over there in that area because our work is actually never done even after we finish these projects. There's no such thing as actually finishing them. So I was over there and, and, and Chewbacca was there and there was a little boy who might have been maybe seven or eight years old and was having this encounter with Chewbacca and kind of they were, they were having this moment. And I, I didn't actually, I wasn't close to them when they're having this moment, but I, I heard this family as they were walking away and this little boy said to his parents, he again must have been seven or eight, said, so wait, Chewbacca is real? <laughs> so wait, that means the Jedi are real? Oh. That means Star Wars is real? <laughs> and I was just like, yep, that, that is what success looks like. You when you can have somebody believe so much that they're willing to kind of you know, put themselves into that story, right. I think that is what I think you know, we can, that's all we can hope for is giving people experiences that they couldn't possibly really be having, but they are. So we work on these worlds, you know, for years to prepare them for all of you. Um, and we have the privilege of walking around in them before they are open, which is a certain subtle privilege, uh, you know, of being in a quiet world full of detail and all the labor and all the, all the soul that people have put into them. But they really are as Scott said, brought to life by you. And so it, it, we, we kind of owe you the debt of gratitude for being the vitality that comes into these lands that makes them more than concrete and steel, more than special effects and some light that blinks on and off or, you know, 
they're made real by you. Uh, and they are made real for you. Uh, and so for that, we thank you and we conclude. <laughs>